y'all for the good singing tonight. My goodness, just a blessing, a blessing indeed. I want you for a few minutes to turn to Nahum, Nahum chapter number one. This is on page 952, 952 in the old Schofield Bible, Nahum chapter number one. The Bible says in verse number seven, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. Y'all have been singing a lot about heaven tonight, and the thing that's going to make heaven worth it all is when we see him. We're going to see him. I'd like to be able to describe God fully, but I can't. I don't have the capacity, and if we were to join together in unison tonight, and try to brag on God and uh, talk about how great God is uh, from now until morning, we still wouldn't cover it all. So, my friend, we all know that He is Lord. That's what our text says. Lord means, means excellency, eminence, means reverence, honor, royalty, majesty, on and on. Now, it would take all day to exhaust the meaning of each one of those. So, I am going to just shorten this message to consider three main things that I see in this one little verse. First of all, the Lord is good. The goodness of God, hallelujah. The goodness of the Lord leadeth to repentance. The goodness of God primarily means the feeling, the grace, the kindness, the pardon, the forgiveness of the Lord. God feels for human beings. He died for us because He loved us. He was a compassionate Savior when He was on this earth. He felt for the sinners that were like sheep without a shepherd, and He wept over Jerusalem, and He cares for our people, and His grace is amazing, and we sing about it all the time, and we thank God for His amazing grace, how sweet the sound, His kindness, His pardon, His forgiveness to all sinners that come unto Him. Now, this is the essential character of our God. God is infinitely good. Now, God's goodness is unchangeable. He's not good one day and bad the next day. Human beings act like they're good, and sometimes they are good in ways one day, but the next day they're altogether different. Now, God's goodness reaches around the entire world tonight. God loves those whom He hath created in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Now, He created this world from His heart of goodness. He testified Himself, and it was good. What God created was good. He didn't make any mistakes about it. His goodness is seen more vividly, though, toward man. God created man from the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. His goodness is magnified in his plan of redemption because that man failed. That man had a fall. Adam sinned and disobeyed God, and he, he fell, and so God had to redeem him or let him go to hell. But aren't you glad that God was so in love with Adam so in love with the human race, so in love with what He created that He said, I've got a plan of redemption. God didn't start that off after Adam sinned. He had a plan before this thing was ever started. He had a plan in eternity past. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. All of creation shows forth the goodness of God this very night. All the good and perfect gifts that come down to us are coming down from the Father. We are showered with good and perfect gifts. I have a message that I preached here some time ago on the good and the perfect gifts. Everything that we have is not perfect, but the good have a lot of good things. I got a good wife. She's not perfect. I got good kids. They're not perfect. I got a good church. It's not perfect. But then I got some things that are perfect. I got a Bible that is perfect. I got a Savior that is perfect. Praise God. I got a salvation that is perfect. Everything that I have in Jesus is absolutely perfect. So every good and every perfect gift is from our Heavenly Father that is so full of goodness. All the good and perfect gifts are from Him. So the joy that fills our hearts today 
shows His goodness. One verse I like over in Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse number 10, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. I ran across that verse many years ago, preached on it, been preaching on it ever since. I've been enjoying it ever since. And I realize when I'm happy and when I'm full of joy, I'm strong. I'm able to face the devil and, uh, and my friend overcome him. But when my joy is gone, when my joy is hindered, and I'm not happy, then I'm a weakling. I'm not able to do what I can do before what I could do before. In 1 Peter 1, 8, whom having not seen you love, and whom though now you see him not, yet believe in you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Our lives are filled with His goodness tonight. Think about the privileges we have. Brother, I'm, priv I'm a privileged human being. I'm privileged to be able to stand in a fundamental, Bible-believing, praise God, fundamental church to the very gills. I mean, we're fundamental all the way. We're not modernists. We're not contemporary. And I'm telling you, my friend, we are old-fashioned, Holy Ghost, uh, uh, churches, church in among others, and brother, we stand uh, for this Bible with all we have. We have no idea about compromising the Word of God. I'm privileged to be able to hold a, a copy of the Holy Word of God uh, right here in my arms tonight. Then I think about our freedoms. I thank God all along that I'm free as an American citizen. Thank God for America. I know that America right now is having problems. But when you've got a bunch of nuts up in Washington, you can't call them anything but a bunch of hate mongers. And that's what they are. I listen to the news every night just to see where they stand. Brother, they're getting worse and worse. They're losing their noodle. I believe some of them's already gone insane with hatred and malice. But I tell you right now, I've got, uh, I've got freedom in my heart if they all go to hell. I've got freedom. I'm free in Jesus. If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. The truth shall make you free. The Bible says you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I remember, and I've told this a hundred times, I know, years ago people would invite me to church. And I'd say, well, what's the use of going to church? Because you go to one, you go to one, you go to one, you're all different. All of you believe different things. Which one's right? I don't know which one's right. You don't act like you know which one's right. You think you are. You think you are. You think you are. But I can't have confidence in that. But if I ever find the truth, I'm going to hang on to it. Well, hallelujah. Believe it or not, one glorious night in Simpsonville, I, had, I found the truth. The truth found me. Jesus came by and, and just picked me up out of the miry clay and saved my never dying soul. All right, there it is. There's the truth. No mix up, no debate, no arguing. Jesus is the Savior. Nobody saved Sammy K. The church couldn't, baptism couldn't, nothing else could, but Jesus did. Now, I know the truth. I've been made free. I'm privileged to know that. Then worship. Oh, my friend, we come to church to worship the Lord. We don't stay here too long, but we come to worship. We come to give Him glory. I thank Him for letting me live through another day. I mean, we don't feel good in our body all the time. We don't feel like jumping up and down and shouting all the time. But hallelujah, He still blesses. We still bless and we can worship Him because of who He is. Justification. I'm just as if I had never sinned. I'm a new man in Christ Jesus. I have a position in heaven. I have power on this earth because of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And I have preservation over in Psalm 37, 28. The Lord forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever. So hallelujah, I'm his forever. Now you don't believe in eternal security? Help yourself. Be miserable if you want to. Be miserable and wrong if you want to. But my Bible says very plainly, God forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever. So Moses asked God one day to show him his glory. Well, if God had shown Moses his essential glory, Moses would have disintegrated. It would have killed him. God couldn't show Moses his essential glory. But in Exodus 33 and verse 19, God said to Moses, I will make all my goodness 
My goodness, we're talking about the goodness of God. He's a good God. Our text says God is good. He said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And God gave Moses a blessing he never forgot. In Exodus 34, 6, And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness. Abundant in goodness and truth. So the Lord is good. That's the first little thing that I wanted us to notice in that one verse tonight. The Lord is good. But then number two, the Lord is a stronghold in the day of trouble. Now this means that He is a place of refuge, a retreat, a defense, a fortress. He's everything for you and me tonight. Hebrews 6, 18, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. We have gone to God for our refuge, for a safe place. He's one of the, the, uh, the he's a, uh, the type, one of the types of uh, the cities of refuge. They're a type of Jesus Christ, a place where the <clears throat> avenger of blood could not uh, get to the man that was fleeing for his life. If he reached one of those six refuges, uh, cities of refuge, he was safe, and my friend, nobody could harm him. Well, brother, Jesus is the refuge, and if we flee to him, nobody, Satan and all of his demons, cannot touch us. My friend can keep his hands off. And I mean, he can tempt, he can roar like a lion, he can discourage if you let him and all the rest, but he cannot get you. He cannot get you. Did you know the devil cannot get a one of us tonight? No way. No way, shape, form, or fashion can he do that. So he is a stronghold, God is, and a defense. Now, if Satan could, if Satan could, he would come against us with everything he has and destroy us completely. But he can't because we have taken refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ. The devil is our enemy. He hates us. But over in Romans 8, 37, the Bible says, Nay, in all these things, name all you want to, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. More than conquerors. He is truly our defense tonight. In Psalms 18 and verse 2, the Bible says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust. Psalm 31, 3, For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. <coughs> we need to <coughs> realize that God is so great, and we're His, and He loves us, He protects us, and He's our leader. He's our guide. Jesus said, the Holy Ghost, when He has come, He will guide you into all truth. In Psalm 91, 2, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. Tonight, who are you trusting? If you had to die right now, are you ready to meet Him? I mean, do you have confidence that if you died right now, you'd go to be with Jesus? You say, well, Brother Sammy, I have some questions about that. You don't have to. If you want to worry, help yourself. But you don't have to. Because what God has promised, He's going to do. I mean, one of these days, before long, this crowd right here, the same crowd right here, is going to be on the other side, praising His name, and we're going to kick up our heels, we're going to shout, and we're going to praise His holy name because we're there. And we didn't get there by being good. We got there by the grace of God. We got there because the blood washed away our sin. We've got a God tonight, folk, and He's the one that made the heaven you sing about tonight. He's the one that promised we'd get that heaven some glorious day. <clears throat> so you can stand on that. <clears throat> you can stand on that from now on. So there are many other scriptures that assure us that God is our our defense. He is our protection. He said, in the day of trouble, hallelujah, He is ours in a day of trouble. He'll take care of us, and that goes to show you you're going to have trouble. Every Christian has trouble. 
Christians are acquainted with troubles. And there's not a Christian in this place or anywhere else exempt from troubles. Troubles come in your line and in mine. Don't you know, my friend, that every Christian, you just look around and talk to them and uh, fellowship with them a while. And before long in the conversation, that Christian, whomever he may be, he will come up with some kind of trouble or he'll talk about it. He'll mention it. He'll want you to pray for him. He'll want you to pray for somebody that he loves. Something's not right. We all face that. No Christian is going to get by in this life without troubles. But he is our defense when there are national troubles, domestic troubles, or personal troubles. We see how troubled we are in our nation tonight. I can't help but dwell on it a little bit every now and then because I watch carefully every day what's going on in America because I love America. I'm an American, red-blooded, born here, raised here, worked here, and preaching here. So we love America. But our leaders are void of wisdom and understanding, most of them. You know that. Without being judgmental or just a critic, I'm telling you, most of our leaders in Washington, D.C. especially, they're void of wisdom. They have knowledge. They have education. They have all of that, but they don't have wisdom because you listen to them talk. You realize, according to the Bible, they're way off from wisdom. They have earthly, sensual, sensual uh, wisdom, not godly wisdom. So the greatest minds in our country right now, many of them, are confused and bewildered. Humans are trying to control things that are out of hand by using their own hands. They're trying to solve it. They're doing everything they can. Matter of fact, I've heard this all my ministry, and it never has worked. I've heard people say from the very day that I started preaching that what we need in our country is more education. Nothing wrong with education, and we certainly do need to be educated. But education will not solve problems in the heart. You can't educate a heart. You've got to let the grace of God take over that. Now, some believe that improving our environment will change attitudes and, and cause us to have a good uh, uh, society. Now, I can go back in my ministry here because I've lived here all my life. And I saw years ago when I was a young preacher where they said about a certain place in Greenville that that place needed cleaning up. Those people were dope addicts, and they were dope sellers, and they were doing this and doing that, and it got rough, and there were a few killings. <coughs> and I, I rode with the policeman several times and went, up, and we, you know, you went to try to straighten out some of the problems he did, and I went with him, and I saw some things that were going on. Well, they came in, and they said, if we can just clean this place up and be on new streets and give them new apartments and, and make everything clean and beautiful and then move people in there, then that'll take care of the problem. That was about 50 years ago, somewhere along there, 50 years ago. And I can take you to that same place right now, and it's just like it was before they ever started. Just like it was. You know why? They didn't go in there with the gospel and preach and get them saved. They didn't change their heart. They just changed their environment. You cannot change a man's environment and change his heart by doing so. He's got to have Jesus Christ. We've got to get busy telling people about Jesus before this thing goes slammed to hell. We've, it's our responsibility to let people know about Jesus. Some believe that these things will straighten the world out. They can't realize that problems cannot be solved when we're departing from God. Oh, my friend, the Word of God says in Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalted the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. So these troubles are real, and they are, of course, troubling to us to a certain degree. But God is still our defense. God is still our fortress, our refuge. So whenever nations have problems, that does not take us away from God. But then we see troubles in the homes. Many homes tonight are troubled. Husbands and wives, they just cannot get along. They are instructed, <coughs> excuse me, in the Word of God how that they can live together. <coughs> they, are have, they must submit themselves one to the other in the fear of God. But some won't listen, won't listen to that. They won't do that. One or the other won't. I've, I've uh, counseled people in my study before 
Some people even kin to me years ago, and I'd get to talking to them, and I'd say, all right, you say what you got to say, and you be quiet, and then you say what you got to say, and you be quiet. And then several times I'd have somebody would talk, and they would everybody be quiet, but then when the other one started talking, that other one wouldn't let him say what he had to say, had to interrupt. And I said, hey, ah. Huh? And then one or two times, they'd just get up out of my study and walk out. Oh, I don't want to talk about this. They couldn't listen. They couldn't sit and get good advice. Because, my friend, they'd rather fuss, I reckon. But uh, sometimes the marriages would mend. Sometimes they would break up, divorce, and all the rest. But listen, my friend, husbands and wives, you can get along. You've got to want to. You've got to obey the Word of God. You say, well, I don't love her like I used to. I don't love him like I used to. Well, bless God, you're wrong. You married him or her. You loved him then. Now love him again. Fall in love again. And there's nothing out there. You say, well, I'm going to go get somebody new. That's not worth a nickel. You won't be happy with that. You'll be married another and then married another and then married another. And after a while, you're going to say, man, <laughs> this is something. Getting all these. It takes submission. It takes submitting yourselves one to the other, but most of all, submitting to God's Word. It takes putting Jesus Christ first because He's to have the preeminence. So we see the troubles in our nation, and we see troubles in homes all over. And then we see troubles sometimes in our personal life. Sometimes we have financial problems, health problems, family problems, church problems, adversity, weariness, sadness. But God is still, in the midst of all of it, our protection, our defense. And in the middle of troubles, that's what it says, He's in the middle of troubles. When we're having trouble, He's still there. Boy, I love that. So the Lord God is good, and then He's a stronghold in the day of trouble. But lastly, He knoweth them that trust in Him. Hallelujah. He knows that little old Sammy K down there, not worth a nickel to anybody but him. He knows I trust him. I believe the gospel. I believe the book. I believe he's coming back. I believe heaven is real. I believe, praise God, heaven is going to be my home for all eternity. I trust him. He knows that. Think about it. He knows you, and he knows me. He knows whether you're trusting him, really, or whether you're putting on some kind of religious front. So then, 2 Timothy 2, 19, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. John 10, 27, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So this is not some religion that has no feeling, no touch, no blessing. I'd like for everybody in our church to feel the touch of the Savior tonight. My friend, listen, you might think that's absurd and unreal. But you get close to God and submit to His Word and His will, and I promise you, friend, every once in a while you'll feel the touch of heaven on you. <coughs> It'll be real. It'll be real. And when you start feeling the touch of God all along the way, you can't wait to get to church. You can't wait to get in fellowship with other people and talk about Jesus and how wonderful He is. I enjoy these men uh, that meet in the prayer room, and we fellowship around God, talk about how great our God is. We have a lot to talk about. You could brag on Jesus forever, as I said in the beginning. You'll never talk about everything about Him. You can't describe Him with your uh, adjectives or whatever. He's too great. But now this tells us a few things right here. He's, he's good. He's Lord. He's good. He's a stronghold in the time of trouble, and He knoweth them that trust in Him. We do not trust in vain. Say, so, brother, if you trust in Jesus, you can't see Him and all that. But I just read where we don't see Him, but we love Him. And because we love Him, we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. You're not going to see Jesus in a person with your natural vision until you get to heaven. I mean, you can strain at it. You can pretend. You can dream about it. You can tell people you saw him. Man, these glasses of mine, you know, every once in a while now that uh, I'm getting older, every once in a while I think I see somebody and I look and there's nobody there. You think I'm going to go crazy over that? Uh-uh. 
These things, you know, are man-made. Anything man-made can't be perfect. But I'm not looking to see Jesus with a natural eye now, but I'm looking to see him, praise God, when we get our glorified bodies, we're going to see him as he is, the Bible says. So we're not trusting in vain. We're trusting a real Savior tonight. So many religious people trust in wealth, in human reasoning, and in fleshly might. It's all human uh, actions, humanizing God and deifying man. Many trust in men are man-made promises. Men can't promise you eternity in heaven. You know, religions, some of them do. Some of them promise people that they're going to heaven. Heard the other night, somebody said purgatory is a place where a sinner goes to really prepare to get to heaven. I thought, my, how foolish that is. There's no purgatory. No purgatory. So nobody goes to purgatory to get set for somebody to pray them into heaven. Nobody can pray you into heaven. Now, see, I don't want to offend religions just to be offending them. I love them. I want them to be saved. But you got, if you're going to preach the truth, you cannot accept, you cannot accept man-made religion that promises you heaven when it will not be there. I was preaching in New Orleans. Samuel was down there the other day. I preached years ago in New Orleans in some churches and out of Wyclosky, <coughs> Louisiana, about 11 or 12 Roman Catholic people came over to hear me preach in those revivals. And I got talking to some of them and they were disillusioned with the Catholic Church because they told me this now, that whenever they were young, if their mama did a certain thing, she went to hell according to their church. But they said, now we can do the same thing Mama did. We don't go to hell. They've changed on that. You could go to hell back then, but now you can do the same thing, not go to hell. Who changed that? The men that ran the religion, not God. Listen, brother, this one doesn't change. God doesn't change. He's the same, Malachi said. I am the Lord. I change not. But they, religion, men will change it and say you can do this or do that. Nobody has ever been prayed out of purgatory because there's no, no such place. Now, if that offends you, I'm sorry, but it's the truth. The only two destinations taught in the Bible is heaven and hell. And, brother, they're taught in the Bible. There's a real heaven and there's a real hell. And, brother, I'm glad hell is not my home. Heaven is my home. Boy, I'm glad y'all sang so much about heaven tonight. Because that's where we're headed, everybody. Heaven is our home. It's real. And so, my friend, many trust in these man-made religions, and they won't do a thing but send your soul to hell. There is a hell. And if you think purgatory is somewhere between earth and hell, you're wrong. You'll go slickly split straight to hell if you die without Jesus. Now, you better believe that, whether you're listening here or by streaming. You better believe what I'm telling you. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Only way. Not two or three ways. He's the only way. If you don't let Jesus in your heart, you will not go to heaven. Hey, by the way, let me tell you a blessing. The other night that little choir sang, weren't they good? They sang, boy, I got a blessing. I got up and preached, and then we prayed, and this little girl was standing right here. And I turned around as I always do and spoke to her. Hey, honey, how you doing and all? And then I turned back around and I looked over here and she's still standing there. Brother Joseph Bridges' little girl. She was still standing there. And I said, darling, you want something? She said, I want to get saved. <laughs> wow. Man, you just, honestly, I almost flew away. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Want to get saved. And I sat down over there and had her up close to me. And I, I explained things, and she understood everything I said. Matter of fact, she could tell me what she wanted. Wasn't no, wasn't no doubt about it. That little girl got saved. Now, let me tell you something, boy, that's worth it all. If that was the only soul I'll ever see for the rest of my life, that's worth it all. Being in church, hallelujah, where they can sing. They know what to sing. Sammy said they didn't request, you know, I got the lovesick blues. They didn't suggest any of that junk. They wanted to sing Amazing Grace, stuff like that. Those little kids have been around the gospel long enough. They know more than some grown-ups do. 
Praise God, folks. Jesus has given us a place where the gospel is going forth. And the gospel is still the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. While I was talking to that little girl, I was thinking about what Jesus said. Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. Now, Jesus told me that in his word. And I was doing exactly what Jesus told me to do. That little girl will be in heaven one glorious day. She may grow up and forget what she prayed, and it doesn't matter. God won't forget it. Hallelujah. I've forgotten what I prayed, the words I said. I don't remember what I said when I got saved, but I know he remembers it. That's all that matters. I'm a human being. I couldn't save myself anyhow. I could pray the most beautiful prayer in the world and still go to hell. If that's all. But hey, Jesus takes over when you call upon his name. What a Savior. So there are refuges, and these are refuges of lies that I've been describing. God's children trust him, and he knows it. God accepts us on our faith. God blesses us here on his promises, and then more to come when we get to heaven. God guides us in our perplexities, he sustains us in our weaknesses. He delivers us in our dangers. He is our fortress. Psalm 84, 11, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. How can we describe God tonight? Simply, the Lord is good. The Lord is a stronghold in the day of trouble. And the Lord knoweth everyone who trusts in him. Everybody who's trusting Jesus tonight, he knows you. Let's stand our feet and bow our heads. Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus Christ, our Savior. Thank you for salvation through his shed blood. <coughs> Father, we thank you for all the things that you have done for us, the things you have given to us, the blessings we've enjoyed and we're enjoying right now. Father, I pray for all these dear ones tonight and those that are on the prayer list Father, I pray for them. I know that you are able to do exceeding abundantly ab above all that we ask or think. So we commit them all to thee right now. Father, take them in your loving arms. Bless them real good. Bless those that are troubled in their minds, in their bodies, in their spirit. I pray that you'll help them to be delivered. Pray that you'll bless them in a real way. Let them fit, sense the presence of God right there with them, wherever they are. Now, Father, take our church, revive it, bless it, use it for the glory of God. Bring us back this coming Lord's Day. The Lord, looking for a blessing, receiving a blessing. I pray that you'll have the table set. I pray you'll have a good meal for us, all ready and ready to digest. And we're coming to look for it. We're coming to, to feast at your table because we know you have a table spread where the saints of God can be fed. So we're coming Sunday, this coming Lord's Day, to be blessed by our Heavenly Father. Thank you for all the blessings you've given us. Continue to bless, and we'll thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.